special. Hey guys, awesome audience you got to have here. Um, so I guess before I begin, I just wanna I wanna thank GET to inviting me, and more importantly, Laura Bikila for asking me to come up. I just wanna thank you guys for having me up here. Um, so I'm Thomas Jockin, and I'm here to give a short lecture. Uh, more particularly, a short lecture about typography or careers in it. Uh, and along the way, we're gonna have dashes of nerd references thrown in there. This is RIT. I feel it's kind of required. And along the way, it's a nice little story about me attempting to impress a girl and failing at it pretty bad. Um, so something to feel about me. I'm from Long Island, New York. If you guys don't know, that's uh, I'm about an hour and a half away from Manhattan, that area. Um, I went to Parsons School of Design for my undergrad uh, for communication design, and then I was accepted into Cooper Union for their postgraduate postgraduate degree in typeface design, otherwise known as Type at Cooper. That's what they called it as, and I was in the, the first year that we graduated. Um, so I guess I mean the whole the whole point of the story is kind of like how this happened because it really wasn't like I was born like like with the letter blocks in my hand just saying yeah I want to draw letters all my life that's what I want to do and really that's not what happened it was just kind of like this weird narrative of life that just kind of went through and uh, I guess the whole point of this this talk is to talk about that process you know and I feel like there are some things I've learned over that course it's been like five years or whatever um, that I think I can like share with you guys so. I mean, the first thing I want to say is just, you know, emphasis on the word respect. You know, when I talk about working with people, I mean, like, your employers, you know, the people you like. You know, I guess what I'm saying here is, so, like, I bring this up because I think a lot of people, especially when they're in school, talk about getting internships as being really important to get it further in the careers and everything. But I think it's really important to talk about what kinds of internships you're getting. I think a lot of people get the hey, it's a cool name or a cool studio, I'll put that name on my resume, and the implicit deal is, me employer does not pay you, you get my coffee, and you don't get to really learn anything, except do my busy work, it doesn't mean anything. And, it's, and in return to that, you get a nice little listing on your resume. Like, there's no, there's absolutely no like investment of interest, no investment of any kind of growth in you as a person for you working with them. And that's, I feel like you need, especially when you're, you know, a pup undergrad or whatever, in school, you know, and I mean, ideally, what should happen is it should be kind of like a master apprentice, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like someone who has some knowledge that you can teach, you can learn something from, you know, and you just grow as a person from being there, and actually authentically care that you actually grow as a designer, and you're not just there to answer their emails and take out their trash and get some coffee, because I have got, I, I've been there, I've had those jobs, and they suck, but. I mean, for me, my, I guess, master, if you want to put it that way, it's a very antique way to talk about it, is uh, this, a type designer named Joshua Garden. He was, it just so happened when I got into my sophomore year of Parsons, Josh had just got hired to teach intro to, to typography, and just to preface it, you know, I was like a painter in, in high school, like I loved painting and drawing, I was very like, very loose, very like artist artsy, I guess you want to say, and, uh, and like, Parsons is a very design-oriented school, and it was very much about very much about execution and perfection, like drawing straight, straight squares and drawing perfect lines. And I absolutely hated it. I barely, I think I barely passed the, the first year, you know. So when I chose to be a graphic designer, I just kind of go down that route. And I saw in my transcript that I'd be taking this thing called typography. I thought it'd be like this really anal, retentive bullshit that I hate so much. It would be like the bane of my existence. And so I spent like that whole summer preparing for it, studying up about it, because I just wanted to have some kind of compensation for it. And then this guy rolls in the first day of class, and he's completely nothing what I expected. He has this, this way of thinking about the world and design that I really respected. And I just like, you know, this is like at 19 years old, I was like, wow, this is the kind of designer I want to be, like when I'm his age, the elder age of like 29. I got a couple years until then, thank God. But, uh, you know, so what happened was, you know, after the first semester, the first semester with him, you know, at the end, I just walked up to him and I was like, "Hey, Josh, you should hire me to work for you." And Josh was like, "Yeah, that's a cool idea. Come to my studio in Brooklyn, and we'll make it happen." I want to preface by saying, like, I don't know if you guys know about the type design world or what this is all about, but it's extremely small. It's only probably in the world, maybe like 50, 50 to 100 of us in the world who actually do this, you know, and most of them. Um, 
Most of them are in Berlin or in Europe and over there. In New York, space is the second major help for it. And, oh no, oh no, we got <sighs> Yo, that's so lame. Anyways, um, I put that on like half an hour sleep. It shouldn't have happened. Anyways, um, unless it's been like a half an hour. All right, but uh, so like I was saying, it was just extremely, it, it was like extremely rare because most type designers who don't get this kind of setup have to learn on their own just over the internet and everything. And it's a much harder process. And it just worked out that Josh had just left his major where he worked at a major foundry called uh, Hefler Fair Jones. So you know like Gotham, the typeface. Uh, he worked on that project. He worked on as much of other projects there while at Hefler Fair Jones. He left right when I asked him to work for him. And he basically just he needed some he actually was going through his entire library of typefaces that he was developing and I was there the whole time for two years as an apprentice to study under him and I got my hands in everything, you know, and how you make typefaces, the production of it, you know, and you find out things you never really expected, like, you know, like when you design for other languages besides English, Latin, you know, you have to do all these accent characters and there's certain ways they have to be drawn so you don't confuse them for another, you know, and I just found that really all very fascinating. Um, like, also another thing too, I always found out, you know, like the uh, Ethel, you know, that's the OE, and the AE, you know, most people see those ligatures, like when they're combined together. That's actually not true. They're diphthongs. Like, meaning, like, they actually, they're not just stylistic forms that look that way, they make a different sound. So, that's one of those, like, small tidbits you learn when you work with a type designer. Um, so, you know, and the thing is, like I said, and it's, by the way, it's, it's, these are the projects I work with Josh, um, sliding through. Um, like I said, I was 19 and I got to like be with this dude where the day was, especially this is, it was really true when you know, I was off in school, like during the winter breaks and the summer breaks, I was working with him full time. I would show up at 8 o'clock and we would like grind out doing work and then we'd have to watch like Family Guy, get some lunch. It was like, and we had this amazing library of type of like a book library of uh, typefaces and specimens to look at. It was just a really good environment. I thought it was a really great environment. So much, I mean, honestly, so much better than like what Parsons actually gave me. No, no dissing Parsons, but you know, it's just it was just so enriching and such a great experience to like learn so much from this guy, you know. And best of all, I thought she was paid to be there after the first like year, after the first semester working with him, you know, which was which was great. I really appreciate that he respected my time, and my and my attention by at least compensating me to be there, you know. So. I was there for two years, and I started when I was a sophomore at Parsons, so it, it, it all kind of seemed logical that he was training me to be a, his assistant to become a typeface designer, and I would inevitably start working for him when I graduated, you know. And that was, you know, it was, it was, it was, that's what I really wanted so much. And then 2008 happened, and things don't always go as according to plan. So like I said, you know, the game plan was I would start working for him, maybe, you know, still doing what I was normally doing after I graduated. Then, you know, maybe after a couple of years, I would start developing my own typefaces for him, like in the, if in the library, and then maybe interfacing with clients directly, and maybe after many more years later, I'd become a partner or some kind of like big shot in the group together. Um, but that was a little story in my pretty head because the reality was it's 2008. I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was like an economic disaster explosion happened, and Josh wasn't immune to it. He basically the way it worked was, and this is great. It's like a great story of hubris because, so I thought I had this job, this job set up, and all my friends are freaking out because they don't got their jobs and they're graduating at the door and it looks like the abyss. Like we're all becoming waiters. We're screwed. Um, and I'm hot stepping because I'm like, yeah, I got my job, I'm all set, I'm moving to Brooklyn, it's going to be fantastic. And then May comes, I get the call from Josh and he's like, listen, I just have, I, I just had a cash, in, like a cash implosion and I lost all, like three of my clients. I can't hire you, I can't pay your salary, I can't do it, you know, and I'm not going to hire you for like three months and then have to let you go. So, you know, what, I mean, so what basically happened was, and, and to top it off, I had already booked like a vacation to myself, like a two-week vacation, when I found this out. Like it was already booked, everything was set, the hotels, the flight, everything. So I'm like, fantastic. I get to go on this awesome trip, and then when I come back, to literally nothing. And I had no plans. I didn't have any plan B. I didn't really know what the freak I was gonna do, you know. And you know. 
And then what happened, when I came back, it became like, I just, I chose like probably the, the hardest and worst decision to do was to be a freelancer. I started, I basically grinded out like the next two to three years as a freelancer, just like, and when I mean grind out, I mean like, you wake up in the morning, you, you go to Craigslist, you look at the job posting gigs, the graphic design, you find out which ones someone applied to what you're talking, what you know, what you do, you email them, and then you gotta haggle with them to get 100 bucks out of them to do a job. Like that was my life for about two years, was that kind of grind out. And that's what student loans and living, and living out that life, you know. And I remember, like, fast forward in 2010, um, I was walking by Parsons, and I ran into my chair in my department, from in the graphic design department, well, and he hasn't seen, he didn't see me since then. And he just looked at me and he said, you've changed. You look like you, you're a man who, who's aged and weathered and handled a great storm. And I kind of get what he was saying, because this is what I looked like when I left the goddamn school. <laughs> like, you know, I only bring this up, not only this, this not to put myself down, but I'm amazed anyone paid me at all, quite frankly. Like, I was still a pup. I really was. You know, like, when people really, when people tell you it's so hard to be a freelancer right out of school, they're not kidding, because most people, are, at the very least, just give the air as if that they're just like no lambs at the slaughter and no idea what to do with themselves. Like, billing and invoicing and managing clients and all the things that are beyond what school can teach you, you know, it doesn't really have that braces on to you to top it off. You know, fantastic, right? Um, and that's the thing, I mean, that's, and that's the thing too. So I spent, so I go from this high point of feeling I had everything going for my life, and then I spent the next two years as a Chrysler's hunter, basically, just grinding out, doing projects, and getting a, a king, and then honestly, like, what kind of kept me along was my faculty from Parsons, some of them really held down, you might even lose, but it's about getting back up and saying, I want this, I'm gonna keep on grinding it out until I get it, you know? And that's where I really felt like those two years especially, the fact is I never stopped designing. I, I kind of like, my, I kind of walked out when I started freelancing with like one thing in my mind, I made a, a, a decision to myself that I was, going to make my money being a designer. I, re I refused to do anything else, and I kind of just chose to pay the price for that. Um, and I'm kind of, regardless of how so hard it was, I was really proud of myself that I was able to do it, you know? But enough of that, more importantly, let's fast forward to, to 2011. So I was at the Typewriters Club of New York, um, and I don't know if you guys know about that. It's like an organization that supports typography uh, and type designers. And they usually host, the, it's really great, especially if you live in the New York area, because um, they host all the great lectures about once a month uh, with fantastic designers. Um, and actually within the audience um, was a really talented designer named Jessica Hish. And when I mean talented, I mean really talented. She's definitely probably one of the most talented designers at, in my generation. And I've always knew of her work, but I never met her actually, to be honest, until that lecture. And so she's great, she's talented, and it's super cute. So I bring this up because so at the end of the lecture, I'm a single male, I'm 24. I decided to have a conversation with her. And she starts talking to me about this type program that's starting up um, for type design at Cooper Union called Type at Cooper. And she's saying how cheap it is and how awesome it's gonna be, and she's teaching the program, and how she's applying for it. And the minute she says she's applying for it, my brain takes off and says, you know, it's a great idea. I'm gonna to totally apply to this program, and if I get in, it'd be fantastic, because this is what's gonna happen in my head. I sit, I'm, sitting in the, I'm sitting in the seat, waiting for her to show up in the classroom. She shows up, she comes, I'm like, oh, hey Jess, how funny are you seeing in this classroom? Remember me, I was in that lecture at, at the TC like last month, how weird. Uh, you know, how about we uh, go for a drink after this? And that, wouldn't that be really cool? So, I do all this, and that's my point, like, such a massive decision, like going to grad school, you know, Quite honestly, you really got decided by a call that go impress a girl. Um, and and to, to be fair, to preface that, it's uh, I was thinking about going to grad school because there's other there were other there was two other grad programs for type design, but they're in Europe. So I was in a position where I was like, I guess my game plan at that time was I was going to pay off my student loans for my undergrad, pay it off, and then and then go to grad school, like finish one set of loans and then continue another one, and not just get them all piled into one. So it was going to be like four to five years at least until I was ready to go um, to, to The Hague, most likely. Um, but so then I hear about this program, and I'm like, well, I've always wanted to like, further my type design education and become a type-based designer. And 
Now I get more of an excuse to do it, so why not? So I apply, and surprise, I get in. <laughs> I get accepted. So everything's going according to plan. I'm in the classroom, the first day of class, I'm all excited. She's there, we have the conversation. I find out she has a boyfriend. <laughs> Whoops. Now, I mean, but you know what? It's not like I'm saying, like, I totally applied to the program just to go ask this girl out for a date, for God's sakes. You know, like, I was in the class with some really amazingly talented designers. And I was really grateful for the fact that I was, like, in a room with them and working with them on projects. Um, so I'm just going like, to talk quickly about a couple of my, my, my classmates from the class. Um, oh, but the arrow over here is Carlos Pagan. He is the designer of the Pinterest logo. If you guys know that service, you guys use it. He's, like, I actually remember, I remember he came home with proofs for that logo, like, in the classroom. And I remember we were, we were critiquing it with them, like, giving critiques on it. Uh, and that, uh, it was funny because I thought it was just some random startup company, and then it just like, fucking blew up into this huge thing. Now I'm like, I saw that logo as a work in progress. I saw those things. I saw those sketches. Sketches. It was, sketch it. It was, it was crazy. Um, whoop. Um, another one is Nick Sherman, who is a wicked smart uh, designer who is responsible for the MyFonts website. Because I don't know if you guys remember, like, way back, I'm talking like early 2000s, before this design happened, my fonts kind of sucked dick um, massively in design. And then they came in, and this is his undergrad, he came in, he kind of like rochambeaus his way into my fonts and like got them to basically redesign the whole site into what it is now. He really like single-handedly did that. It was amazing. Also, he's just, he's a really, he's well known in like talking about like wood type, letterpress printing, things like that. And uh, he recently wrote an article about the history of type testaments. He's like, he's, He's kind of become like academic in my field, and I, it was really cool to have him in the room. Um, and this is Aaron, Aaron Carabella. He is one of the lead uh, guys at the Friends of Type blog. It's a really cool blog that like does lettering projects and things like that. And he's a you know, really talented designer. And he does really cool work. You know, and that's the thing about it. Like, I feel like the whole group as a collective did some really awesome work. This is the like a group poster we did of all our work from the, the year at Cooper Type, and. I thought it was really awesome to work with these great guys. And more importantly, within that group, I, was, I kind of got really inspired and pushed to like develop my own typeface for once. Because I work for other people for designs a lot of times. And for a long time, I didn't really feel like I had a voice typographically to like make my own thing into the world, to be worth people using in the world. You know? And for me, that, that, that kind of came to be, though, from being in Cooper Type and working with, well, my, with my friends in the class. Um, and this project it was, is called Galveston Grotesque. Um, it basically was the brief was how to make copperplate gothic not suck. Because as a graphic designer, I saw all over the place there really wasn't any kind of comparable you can use instead of it that worked better, and yet everyone wanted to use it. It was everywhere. Like you just kind of do any kind of search, like you know, like a little like a like a gold or sell gold or silver selling place or or like a trading place. I see them a lot of those, like buy, sell, gold, whatever, like in copper plate, all over the place. Um, so, and, I, and the thing about it, like, it was a very methodical process. Like, the first step was kind of reviewing copper plate was those goddamn spurs, because that's what copper plate's kind of known for, is a sans serif, very monoline overall, very low contrast, um, but with these spurs added on it. And almost all the additions of the uh, copper plate, it has like, these bracketed ser uh, serifs, or spurs, you want to call them, one or the other, uh, meaning that's the transition between the main stroke and where the letter, the, sp the spur comes out. It's a soft transition. Um, so the problem with that is, especially when copperplate gets used large, it just gets really horsey and really like ugly and unexpected because you don't really expect it that much. Um, so my solution for that was to treat it more as Latin serifs, meaning they're very, they're unbracketed and they kind of they're very wedge shaped. Um, so what this does is it creates kind of that cleanness factor in smaller sizes that a plate gets, gives you, but at larger sizes it gives you a much more satisfactory effect. Um, another part, another part of the solution for me was the angle of the terminals. Car plate, if you look on the bottom on um, coastline, it has what's called angle terminals. So basically, if you imagine like that C and the S there at an angle. Um, what this does, it causes like weird word collisions because typography is all about how words interact with each other, like letters interact with each other to make, to make words. And, you know, I felt like the angle terminals were just really not helping with these weird spurs being thrown all over the place. 
So for my, again, uh, one of my solutions was to do vertical terminals in this case. So everything kind of got cut at like 90 degrees or, eight, or 180 degrees, uh, just to kind of give everything like a very tailored, clean cut. And then what's really important, actually, this is what my classmates, my classmates all kind of gave me a word of hesitance or concern when I told them about this project that I was going to do this because copper plates are uppercase, type case design only. Like it only has an uppercase. And there's a very good reason why, because those spurs seem very weird and very odd to be putting on your lowercase letters. And any design that really has attempted to do that doesn't, has done it not very well because it's just so awkward and weird. Um, so for me, I knew that I knew kind of going in that the main battle was going to be these, this lowercase and how to make this thing work in the whole design. Um, and I did a couple solutions for that. One solution was basically for letters like ACE, where there's a kind of a transition in curves, where you see this, the highlighting area happen. Um, they have a very uh, what's called high shoulder, meaning there's a very a very abrupt, relatively abrupt transition between you know the, for a horizontal stroke and the vertical stroke. Um, it kind of helps to give like enough substance in those areas to hold up uh, with the spurs. And then for for really bad, really hor like troublesome letters like a, like lowercase G and T, um, I looked at the calligraphy examples to see where spur could be added and still harmonize with everything with uh, the rest of the design.